When I was much younger, hundreds of years ago, as my children would say, I spent some time working in hospitals as a counselor, and I was fortunate to be studying with a student, Victor Frankl, one of the survivors of the Holocaust. And periodically, some of my interviews with patients would be read by Victor Frankl. One of the remarkable features of Frankl was the sense of hope that he derived out of the darkest of conditions. And an image that I remember from him is a day in which he had given up, in which life seemed no longer important for him and was very difficult for him to continue. And yet there was a turning event that day that sent him back to his barracks and to his bed. And that evening he looked out across the countryside and a farm light came on in the distance. And that farm light stood as a symbol that not only does the past shape our future, but our future shapes our present, and that our hopes determine really what we will be. Much of what we do here at Stockton that focuses on Holocaust studies is based on that hope. As George Santayana once said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat. And it's our hope for the future that keeps us from repeating it. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Winkler, Chairman of the New Jersey Holocaust Commission. Paul. It's a great honor for me to be here this evening. Holocaust education in New Jersey is something that we've been working toward and with for over 30 years. And I'd like to first start by just in this hall and to you thank the Stockton, the Richard Stockton College and the Holocaust Resource Center. What they have done throughout not only South Jersey, but all of New Jersey with the training and the workshops, the programs, the exhibits, the programs for students and teachers has allowed us in New Jersey to move forward and teach in our classrooms to help implement that mandate of Holocaust genocide education. We're very pleased from the commission to be part of a program where the story of Anne Frank through Hannah Pick can be told and shared with you and for all of us to hear. But more exciting to hear about the schools that HANA will be visiting in the next few days. We have a goal in New Jersey. Our goal is a very simple one. Every student in the next five years, we must get them to meet with a Holocaust survivor in all types of programs. Once again, here in Stockton, Richard Stockton College, the Holocaust Resource Center is taking a lead in providing that direction. Our goal is to have students meet with survivors and feel and understand. We are not interested in facts and figures alone. We don't want students only to be able to repeat a timeline or dates or spell words that are difficult to spell. We want them to feel something and understand. And just as the president said, we want the students of today to take that challenge and that responsibility so the world of tomorrow will be better. That's our goal in Holocaust education in New Jersey. That's what the mandate talks about. This program falls right in line with helping toward meeting that mandate of allowing you, the participants, and those students tomorrow to understand and realize what happened, how it happened, and what are some of the things we can do. We have one simple goal. The President and I did not share together what we would say, but our goal is what he ended with. We want our students to become 
the upstander, not the bystander, the person who cares and does something, the student, the adult, the community. So I'm looking forward to this evening and to hearing the wonderful news of the schools in the next few days. Thank you once again for allowing us to be part of this and we thank you once again here for the works that, work that you have done. I now like to turn to Jan Colleen, Dean of General Studies. Thank you. Good evening. Um, given the fact that it's inclement weather, may I ask the people in the top rows to squeeze in a little bit toward the middle so that if people come late, that they'll find a place to sit, particularly when the house lights go out. It'll be helpful if you go as much to the middle as, uh, as you can. And we'll give you a minute to do that. Thank you very, very much. Now we even have room for the uh, <coughs> fans who are out there watching the women play soccer this evening. And uh, at least you're high and dry. Thank you. Last December 30th, I was in Amsterdam with my family, my wife and my daughter, visiting friends and family. It was a bitter cold night about minus 15, light snow falling. And uh, we're on our way to see friends who actually work with us at the Anne Frank Center. And um, as we walked in the neighborhood, a Japanese family came to me and they said, you know, can you tell us where the Anne Frank Center is? We'd like to see the house. And it was 6.30 at night, and I didn't have the heart to tell them that it probably would be closed. And so I said, well, why don't you walk with me? We're going right by there, and I'll show you where it is. And as we came around the bend of the Westerkerk, the church that Anna could see from the attic, quite remarkable scene. Hundreds of people respectfully, quietly, waiting to get in at 6.30 at night to get into the house and to see where Anna had spent her last years. Frankly, I was stunned, um, but then it reminded me how powerful the story is to so many of us. A diary that has been translated into dozens of languages, read by tens and tens of millions of people made into a Broadway play, made into a film, and then much later made into two rather extraordinary documentaries. First, uh, Willie Lindworth's The Last Seven Months of Anna Frank, which won an Emmy, and then subsequently in an Oscar-winning documentary by the British filmmaker John Blair, who some of you may remember taught here a year ago. And that documentary was Anne Frank Remembered. And the main protagonist in both those documentaries is Anna Frank's best friend, who you'll meet shortly, Anna Pick. Her story parallels the story of the Franks in, in quite extraordinary ways, as you will soon hear. Uh, coming out of Germany, going into Holland, and the rest of which you will hear more about tonight. <coughs> it's remarkable because Mrs. Pick is such a vivacious and such a hope-giving witness. But we also should remember that it differs in one very important way. Anna did not come back. Anna Pick did. 
of the 107,000 people who were deported from Holland to Germany, only 5,200 came back. 19 out of every 20 did not. That is the brutal face of genocide. That is the reality. Hanna, however, survived, and it is now my great pleasure to introduce you to our honored guest this evening, Hanna Pick. Hanna Frank's best friend. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. Your fourth time with us. We're so privileged time. to have yes. you. As I just noted and made reference to, the, the story of you and Anna are remarkably similar in a lot of ways. Uh, you were born in Germany. As I remember, your grandfather was a prominent attorney in Berlin. Yes. And then you go to Holland before the war. And then the stories become intertwined. Uh, perhaps we can begin this evening by talking about how you and your family left Germany how you immigrated to Holland, and then how you got to meet Anna, and how you became friends. Okay, good evening. Um, I tell this story because Anna wrote in her diary, why God let her live, and I, her best friend, may be already dead. And now you see me sitting here, and I'm a great grandmother, my revenge to Hitler. <laughs> And Anne couldn't even be 16 years old. She had to die only because she was born a Jewish girl. In the diary, there's just written, she died, and nobody knows exactly, so maybe I can help a little bit. But I also tell it because, you know, in the Holocaust there died or were murdered six million Jewish people, one and a half million Jewish children. But I think if you hear the story of one, it's much easier to identify yourself than if you hear six million. That's, you can touch it, it's impossible. But the story of one can touch you and you can understand a little bit better, I think, what happened. And if you think um, New Jersey has how many inhabitants? Uh, a little bit more than six million? About eight and a half. And you think it's all wiped out. No one living anymore in New Jersey, only the rest of America. Maybe then you know what is six million. Okay. So I was born in Germany, in Berlin, the capital city. And my father was an advisor to the Minister for Domestic Affairs. And the moment Hitler was chosen to power, the whole government had to step down, and with them, my father. And he understood that he has not to stay anymore in Germany. He took my mother and me, and we went first to England. There, my father, that was a religious Jew, got a wonderful job. He was an economist from um, his profession, and he got a job with Unilever. But when he told them that he couldn't work on the Shabbat, on the Saturday, in Germany, in the office, he didn't work on the Saturday. He came, he looked what came with the mail, and he went to synagogue. And Sunday, all alone, he sat in the office and worked. And now in England, they told him, that's impossible, you have to work at the Saturday. And my father, he was born not as a religious Jew. He was born with pork eating, with a Christmas tree. And he found his religion in the First World War as a soldier, as he was sent from Germany as a German soldier to, Russia, to Poland. And there he met for the first time in his life, Jewish life and Jewish people that were religious, and he was so impressed that he came back from the war as a religious man. And so, when they told him, you have to work, he said, no, that's impossible. Money was never important for him. 
but his religion that he found himself was very important, and he left England. And what shall I tell you? Instead of then going to the, Amer to the States or to Palestine, he went in the wrong direction. He went to Holland. But who could know what will happen then? In Holland, he opened a very little office together with a lawyer that also was a refugee, Mr. Ledermann. He has a daughter in this country, Barbara Rothbell. And um, they wanted to help other refugees to go on or to the States or to settle in Holland. He rented a very small apartment and there we lived at the Merwede Plain. First week in Holland, my mother took me to a grocery shop and there she met another woman, also a refugee. Both started to speak in German. Nobody knew Dutch at that time. And it came out, it was Mrs. Frank with her little girl, Anne, half a year younger than me. And later, some days later, mother brings me to kindergarten, and I don't know the language, I don't know anybody. And I say, mommy, take me home. I don't, uh, what do I do here? But then I saw this little girl with her back. She was making music on little bells. She turns around, she finished making music. She ran in my arms. And that was it, mother could go home. And much later I learned it was also her first day and she, sh she remembered me from the grocery shop and she didn't know anybody else. And later through our friendship, our parents got to be friends also. We were living entrance, next entrance, and we really did everything together, Jewish holidays, the Shabbat, they came very often to our home. At the day like St. Nicholas, um, we didn't have at our home, so I could go there. And 31 of December, we also didn't have at our home, but then I could go early to Anne because it was vacation, and we would play and we would go to sleep at 12 o'clock. My parents were invited, they would wake us up five minutes earlier. We got something to eat, to drink, and we were very happy. And then we went to sleep. Next day was vacation, we could play. Every Sunday, I would go to hear what was at school at Saturday, because I wouldn't go to school. Anna would go to school. And then afterwards, Mr. Frank would take us to his office. The office of Mr. Frank is the today very famous Anna Frank House that Professor Colin mentioned with more than 700,000 visitors a year. It's newly re renovated now, and you can see there how Mr. Frank worked there, where the family was in hiding. There is a bookshop, there are films, and so on and so on. And you heard there are always people waiting outside. The Frank family was quite different from my family. My parents uh, were university taught people. My mother was a teacher in Germany, and in Holland, she went to be the secretary in this little office. Mrs. Frank didn't work, and nobody knows what did she learn, even uh, the cousin of Mr. Frank in Switzerland, he doesn't remember, so we will not know, but she was a very good housewife and a very nice woman. Mr. Frank, he had always very good connection with young people. And I remember at night, he would, uh, when I came there, I couldn't eat there, it was not uh, kosher, but I came there very often and joined them. And Mr. Frank would drink beer. My father never drank beer. And then he would fill his glass, and Anna and me, we were waiting, waiting. Sometimes it shall stream over. Never happened. He always looked at us, but he stopped at the non-right moment. <laughs> and we were very sorry about it. <laughs> and when I learned uh, riding on a bicycle in Holland, everything goes by bicycle. Mr. Frank would run after me in the street, not my father. He really, he was a very, very nice man. Also later, when my sister, I come to this, was born, she didn't want to eat. Mr. Frank came in, would give her the food, everything was okay. He was something very special. He also was a big optimist. My father always was a pessimist. And Later on, he would say, the Germans will kill all of us, everything is so bad. And Mr. Frank said, oh no, the Americans will help in the war, everything will be wonderful. It was never wonderful, but it was very good to hear it. 
and that was his, maybe it helped him to survive. Now, Mrs. Pick, the, 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 in the diary, uh, we get to know Anna as she saw herself, and then we get to know Anna as, we get to know everybody around her, you as Lise, and then later as they go in hiding, we get to know Mr. Dussel, and we get to know the rest of the family through Anna's eyes. But you saw Anna through your eyes. What do you remember? Uh, Anna was a girl that always wanted attention. And to get attention, she could do something. Please, if there are children here, don't try if there's not an orthopedic doctor in the neighborhood. <laughs> she, could, she could take out her shoulder out of the socket. And then you would see in front of the class, everybody <coughs> would look at her that she liked very much. And it would, you wouldn't see so much what she did, but you would hear it. It would go by knack, 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 knack. <laughs> everybody looked at her, and she was very, very happy. <laughs> she also always would write. You know, she would um, have an, um, uh, uh, her papers. She would shield it and she would write and write. And if somebody dared to ask, what are you writing? She would say, that's not of your business. So we don't know till this day, because you know the diary, it started much later. It started almost three weeks before she went into hiding. So maybe there was another diary before. Also <coughs> Margot wrote a diary, but it was never found. So we don't know. But Anna left also very nice stories, stories for young children. Every story with a messer. She would write about colored children, poor children, sick children. And everything she thought that the world doesn't take care enough, she would give her opinion. It was a nice story with a message and nice to read for children. You can still get it, I think. It's called um, Stories of the Secret Annex by Anne Frank. Uh, my mother would always say about Anne, God knows everything, but Anne knows everything better. <laughs> 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 but that's <coughs> like she was. And so in the beginning, we went to kindergarten together. We went to the uh, elementary school together, a Montessori school. And life was very pleasant. We had Jewish friends, we had Christian friends, we were at a general Montessori school, all kids together. But then um, it started to be not so nice. You know, the First World War started 1st of September 1939, and in Holland, the Germans invaded Holland at 10 May 1940. At the beginning, they started to see how much the population helps and uh, we were still living there in peace. In meantime, in October 1940, my little sister was born, and about her I will tell you because I don't think there are a lot of people that survived at that age um, still a concentration camp. She was four and a half after the war, so it was really a big miracle that she is alive, and she lives with me in Israel, we live in Israel, and she is, thank to God, a wonderful, she was a wonderful teacher, and now she is also um, in pension, um, in retired. retired. Mm -hmm. And she only does good things. She works one day in a hospital, and uh, all, every time volunteering all over, and she has already eight grandchildren. Okay, so my little sister was born in October 1940. And now we didn't go to the office of Mr. Frank anymore at Sundays, but Anne and her older sister Margot, three years older, came to our place to look how my mother takes care of the baby, makes a bath for her, and then all three of us very proudly would walk with the children's uh, carriage. But, but Margot, I, I didn't speak about Margot, Anne's sister, <laughs> and she really was a wonderful girl. Every mother would like such a girl at her home. She was very obedient a very good student at school and very good looking. Anna and me, okay, we were not so good at school, <laughs> and so on and so on. But in the meantime, the anti-Jewish measures had begun in Holland. Um, 
yes. I think as early as July 1940, uh, Jewish people could no longer work in the civil service. And a bit later, you couldn't go to the movies anymore. And then you couldn't go in the parks anymore. Can you tell us a little bit about how, yeah, how the isolation began? Look, we were girls, so we didn't feel it so much and so sad as it was, but we had to leave our school. And I remember our headmaster, Mrs. Kuperos, she really tried, uh, was um, crying. She liked the children by their characters and not by their religion and didn't help her. We were one third of the population because in this neighborhood lived a lot of uh, emigrants from Germany. We had to go to a new open Jewish school that was only with Jewish teachers and Jewish uh, school children. And there again, Anna and me were together. We would walk there because we were not allowed to go anymore with a bus or with then there were no buses, with a tram. In Holland, you have these electric uh, trams. We had to walk to the school, and we would always go together. The bicycle that Anna had, she had to give to the government, the radio we had to give, the telephone we had to give. And we just lived like this. When we wanted to go to a swimming pool or to sit at a bench in the park, there was written, Jews and dogs not wanted and so on and so on. We couldn't buy in any shops, only in Jewish shops, and only from three to five. That will say that the Jewish shopkeeper went to the Christian one and could buy at three, uh, three o'clock the leftovers, and then till five o'clock sell it to us. We had to be at eight o'clock at home till six in the morning. And then the Germans started to make lists. Nobody knows, or I don't know exactly how did they make these lists with the Jewish population. At 8 o'clock, everybody was at home, and then they would come and take you from your home. With just a reason that we were Jewish. And they would say, you are going to the east. Everything was the east. They didn't say where we go. And there you have to work. Look. To work is not so bad, and we always thought, we are working, the war is uh, soon over, and everything will be okay. But it was not okay, and we didn't go to work. Most people were going to the gas chambers. They wouldn't tell you, you are going to Auschwitz to be killed. And even there were rumors. People would speak about it. They would keep it from us, the children. But people would speak about it, and then, they would say, what are you telling us? That's a crazy idea. The Germans, after all, they brought to this world a Beethoven. They are decent people. They have culture. They will not have such an idea. Never, you heard never of gas. You had gas to cook. But that you kill people with gas, I think that was the first time in this world. So people wouldn't believe. And then they would say, no, we are going to work. If we really would have known what happened, I think much more Dutch people would have helped, a lot helped, and they helped with um, danger of their own lives. But they didn't know what will happen, and much more Jewish people would have tried to go over the borders, and that was also very hard because most uh, countries closed the borders. And then we had... Um, uh, still a party at school, the end of the school year, that in meantime, Mr. Frank fixed a hiding place we didn't know. These were things you never could speak about because the Germans could torture you, torture you, and then you would tell things you didn't want to tell. So we didn't know. The kids didn't know, the kids of Mr. Frank. We had a party at school, the end of the school year in June. And in the beginning of July, I wanted to go to play with Anna. I go over, and I ring, and I ring, and nobody opens the door. And I didn't understand, where could she be? I ring again, and they had a Jewish tenant. He came down, he lived under the roof, and he came down, and he looked at me. He knew me for nine years. What do you want? What do I want? I come to play with Anna. We have vacation. And don't you know, the Frank family left for Switzerland. So I didn't know, and they didn't leave for Switzerland. But I knew that Mr. Frank had a mother living in Switzerland, and so we hoped maybe. 
And you know, the funny thing is, I don't tell this always, there was a rumor going on. People saw a man from the SS going to the Frank apartment and he helped them to go over the border. But you know, I, I, I was lucky to meet Mr. Frank after the war and I asked him, no one. But the funny thing is people saw this man, you know, and it was not true. And so they didn't go to Switzerland and maybe they were lucky because with two girls to go over the mountains, to walk there, impossible. So at least they had to live two years longer and we have the diary today. Now, Ms. Pick, if I remember correctly, you had Paraguayan passports. Yeah, my uncle in Switzerland could buy, but that came later, a little mm -hmm. bit later, because at this moment, my mother again was pregnant. And the Germans were so nice that in 1942, when they came with a list and they saw a pregnant woman, in 1942 only, they would leave this pregnant woman with her family at home. So at the moment, we were at home because of my mother's pregnancy. And then happened something very sad. It was again in October. My sister was born October 40, and now it was October 42. The Frank family left for hiding, but we didn't know. And now my mother had to give birth to this baby. But what happened was she had a Jewish doctor and we had a Jewish midwife. But there were complications and my mother died by childbirth with a baby. And now we had no mother and no something that uh, kept us at home. And at that moment, my uncle could send a passport of Paraguay. We were German uh, people, German nationality. But when we went to Holland, the Germans took away our passport. You know, my family was for 400 years German, and my father was a soldier in the German army, I told before. Nothing would help. And they took away our passport. And in Holland, you have to live for 10 years, then you can get a Dutch passport. But 33, it would be 43, it was a German occupation. So we never got a Dutch passport. What's it? <laughs> and so we were without nationality. And that's always very bad. People have to have some nationality. And here my uncle from Switzerland could buy in a South American consulate a passport and send it. Some 400 families got passports of South American countries. They were um, neutral countries. And in the meantime, the Germans said, you can stay at home. But we got something else. And my family thought that's even more important because if you wanted to stay at home, you needed a stamp. We had a J in our passport, so everybody knew we are Jewish. We had to have this uh, Jew also on our clothes. But if you could get at your identity card a stamp from the Germans that you can stay in meantime at home, that would help. So we got it for this Paraguayan passport, but for something else. One stamp for two different things, but without this stamp, I wouldn't sit here today. The second thing was like this. My father was not only a very high official in the German government, he also was one of the founders of the so-named Mizrahi movement, the Jewish um, religious Zionist movement. And he always worked that one time we also will have our own state, our own land for the Jewish people. And in Holland, people knew this. And now in 42, there were negotiations between the English and the German, even there was a war going on in Switzerland. The English did it out of humanitarian reasons, and the Germans did it because they wanted a very small group, about some 4,000 Jewish people, to set them apart and one day exchange them against soldiers, um, German soldiers, prisoners of war. And now everybody wanted to be at this exchange lists. But it was only for people that had children or parents or brothers and sisters in Palestine. 
and were stuck in Holland because of the war. Now, we didn't have this, but the Dutch people knew that my father was always very busy to help the Jewish people and to help that there once will be a state. So we got a place at the second exchange list as so named veterans. And that's at the end what uh, saved us. Because at the end there were 40 lists and that was too much. I come to this in two minutes. We were at the second list without, uh, I don't know, God helped. And now it helped, we hope, till the end of the war. No, wishful thinking. It helped till 20 of June 1943. At that day, nothing helped, no stamp, no nothing. The Germans came with the Dutch police and the vans, and they went from door to door. Holland was empty with Jews. Only in Amsterdam were still Jewish people living, and only people with this stamp. And at that day, they took everybody. And I have to tell you, we had a very nice German Catholic neighbor. She lived downstairs. We lived uh, the steps up. And she came to live there after the death of my mother. And she was very sorry for my little sister, such a little girl, no mother. She always invited us to come and play with her little son. That was forbidden. Jewish people were not allowed to play it with Christians. And this woman went to the SS that came to take us and stood there and was waiting. And she asked him, can't I get this little girl at least? And he shouted at her, you, a Dutch Christian, aren't you ashamed? And she answers him, I am a German Christian and I am not ashamed. Then she fainted, but she didn't get the little girl. This woman later sent us a package to the camp with a book. And the book was about the first registered nurse, Florence Nightingale. And that was the only book um, beside my prayer book that I had in the camp. And I read it so often that after the war, I went to be a nurse. And I could still <laughs> tell her. Now, the, the, after you are arrested, you go to a camp in the north of Holland called Westerbork. Yes. Which is known as a transit camp. Can you tell us what kind of a camp that was? Uh, look, um, people had to work there. But the camp was not the worst camp. The food. Um, it was not a lot, but it was very good. I wouldn't be so fat as today. I could have survived there. It, it was enough, we will say. The work was not too hard, but in the middle of the camp there were the rail tracks, and every week there would come these cattle cars, and there had to be a thousand people inside, and uh, they were sent to the east. My little sister and me, we came in an orphanage. And that was really the best place to be under these circumstances. This family tried to make some food, and the woman even went to the commandant of the camp and asked for some more food for us children. And there I got to know also Mr. Spiegel that's sitting here and tells his story always. And um, then we come to this 20 of November. And you know, that was like this. There were some 150 orphans. These were not orphans. These were families that couldn't go together like the Franks in hiding with the kids because the kids were too young. And in the city, if you got with a little kid in hiding, the kid would cry once a week, once a day. And the neighbors, if they were not good neighbors, they would go to the SS and say, Look, this old lady, she had no grandchildren. Who is crying there? Go and look, maybe they are Jewish people. And they would get some five dollars or so for every Jew they would give in. So that was too dangerous. So the parents could go in the city and somewhere go into hiding if somebody took them. But the children they would bring mostly in villages to farmers. Farmers have more children, there is more room, they can cry and so on. But the Germans would look also with the farmers. The identity card was very often a false one because you had to take out the J for Jew. And they would see immediately if it was not made real uh, professionally. And all these children they would find without the parents came in the orphanage. 
And in November 1943, again, these trains came. And there were no thousand people to be sent to the east because everybody had a stamp to stay there. And at that very bad night, the commandant said, I don't need 40 lists for exchange. I need only two. And God help my sister and me and my father, we were at the second list. But that night, I will never forget, almost the whole orphanage was emptied. We had a rabbi, he wanted to bless the children with a big prayer shawl, but didn't help. The children were sent with the teachers straight to the gas chambers, but we didn't know that. And then it was our turn in February 1944. This same commandant, Gemmeke was his name, he called all the people that still were there with the passports of South America and with the first and second exchange lists for Palestine. And he said, now it's your turn, but you are going to a wonderful exchange camp in Germany, Bergen-Belsen. You are not having, you don't have to work there. That was not true, but this is what he told us. And in the morning, there came real, a real train, no cattle cars. And we felt, oh, we are lucky people. Why couldn't we stay at home and wait to be exchanged? Why didn't we have to be sent to Germany? But nobody asked questions already. And we were sent to this camp. And here we had to, um, they were shouting, there stood this SS man, like sardines, one next to another, and um, shouting and so on with big dogs. Then, since then, I don't like dogs, not big ones, not small ones. And we went into the camp, and I was lucky, I was not yet 16. Till 14, you were a child. From 16, you had to work. I was 15. Mothers with children, this was, I think, behind, um, only Theresienstadt, the only camp with children. Mothers with children under three years didn't have to work. My sister was three and a quarter, so I didn't have to work. I could take care of my sister. But I didn't tell you before, in July, two weeks after we came in this orphanage in Westerwork, my little sister got very, very sick. She had to have an operation behind her ears. We found a Jewish doctor, because all the good Jewish doctors were with us. He operated her, but it didn't heal. And when we were sent in February to Bergen-Belsen, my sister had still a big, big bandage. And we come in this camp, and the second day in the camp, I got sick. And I didn't know, what shall I do? They told me, you have jaundice, you have to go to a hospital or to an um, isolation barrack. What am I do, going to do with my little sister? I can't leave her alone with such a bandage, three years and four months old. Impossible, and I didn't know what to do. And that night, I met a woman that I knew from Holland, and she saw I am out because I cannot go to a neighbor and say, please be my babysitter, that's not fair. Everybody, we didn't know it was a little bit better camp. And uh, you cannot do this to anybody because everybody was very busy to keep his family alive. Uh, why was it better? This we learned much later, that in all the other camps, children immediately were sent to the death uh, camps, to the gas chambers. Men and women were divided, here not. There were barracks for men, barracks for women, but there was a barbed wire. But every night at 7 o'clock, we could till 8 o'clock be together. That was very important. We didn't get a number, we didn't get shaved, and they didn't take away our luggage. That was also very important. Even the things were already very bad because it was old and washed with cold water. But we had our own things, and there was no killing in Bergen-Belsen. Later, people died of typhus and of hunger, but there was no killing. And so they told me I have to go to the isolation barrack. And this woman said, why are you so upset? And I told her, what am I doing with my sister? And again, God helped. She said, you know, I have a niece. Maybe she can help you. Your father always helped everybody. 
she came back with her niece, a woman, a religious Jewish woman with seven children of her own. Two boys were with the father in the barrack for the men, and five girls with her. And she took my little sick sister that she didn't know and was not of her family, and she took care of this little girl a whole month till I was healthy again. And she said to me, you know, you change your barrack, you come to live with us, we are one big family. That's what I did. And the third thing that saved my sister, I saw little kids under three years got milk. I don't know how much water was in the milk, but they got milk. My sister was over three years, so she didn't get any milk. And what happened was, the woman that um, gave this milk, there was one barrack with Jewish people from Greece, Saloniki. And by accident, the woman that had to give the milk to the children was with her husband two years in Berlin, and my father knew them. And so the husband said to his wife, if you have left some milk, give it to this little girl. Maybe we can save her. And the woman did it. But you have to understand, she had two children of her own. If they would have gotten three glasses milk, twice a week, not every day. Don't overdo it. It wouldn't be too much. And you have to think that every mother that had a child that was three years, three and a half, four years, they went to this woman, they would give her a chain, a, a sweater, a piece of bread. Please, please give me some milk for my child. And I had nothing to give her, and she gave me, I think it was only the first half year, the whole time I think she gave me this twice a week glass of milk. And such a sick little girl, if she gets two glasses of milk a week or just water, I think it's the difference between life and death. But now it starts to be hell in this Bergen-Belsen. And why? Look. The English and American come from the West. They come through France, they had the invasion, and come to, cover, uh, to occupy Germany. The Russians came through Poland. The Germans didn't want the Russians to see what they did in Poland. They tried to empty all the camps and took the people that still could walk on very, very dreadful death marches. I was not so long ago in Berlin, and there in Oranienburg is still written, here pass the death marches, and this is hundreds of kilometers, without shoes, without food. Okay, I think you know about it. And then the very, very sick state in Auschwitz, because the people, the Germans thought they will die before the Russians come. But there was a group in the middle, and they would be brought in trains, in open trains, also to our camp Bergen-Belsen. And now the camp that was at the beginning quite empty gets every day full and full and fuller. By the liberation, there were 60,000 people. When I arrived there, there were, I think, 1,000. And these people that arrived from August, I think, maybe earlier, 44, they caught typhus on the way, they got lice. I was told in Auschwitz there were no lice, I don't know. But they got typhus from lice. And that was one of the main reasons, not only the hunger, that the people died like flies in Bergen-Belsen. A lie, lice, lice needs a warm body. And so the people died, they would go on and came also to our camp. It was a very big compound. And so we also got typhus. A lot of people died of this. And then again there came a whole new group, but everything was full. People died, but not quick enough. And now these people were brought next to us. There was an open field. We were at the end in, an, uh, in 20 barracks. And the Germans gave us an order we have to empty up. These people were in these uh, tents brought. And in November, were, it was very cold and windy. All the tents blew down. And then we got an order. In some hours, we have to um, leave 10 barracks and all live together in the 10 others. Till now, we had two-story beds. We got a third one. 
and we had to sleep two together. And the woman, it were only 7,000 women, we learned later, that were next to us in the open field, in the tents, got our 10 empty tents, um, barracks. And now we are very near together, and we wanted to know who are they, from where are they. Maybe we know them, we have friends also, but we couldn't speak with them. The Germans let build a very high fence, they put straw in it so we couldn't look through, and they put German uh, soldiers in uh, little wedge towers at the top with a river. So it was very dangerous to go near the fence. And it had another reason. They spoke mostly Polish and Czechish, and we came from Greece and from Holland, from Germany. We had some people from Yugoslavia, from Libya, that's not known, that also in Libya the Jewish people were sent to the camps, and from um, France. So we didn't know these languages. So I didn't go near the fence. And it took from November till February that somebody told me, you know, your friend Anne Frank, she is here at the other side of the fence. And I got crazy. I thought about everybody, but Anne Frank, she is in Switzerland with her grandmother, eating Swiss chocolate and making fun. <laughs> oh, it wasn't so funny. And so, at one night, I go near the fence and I try to call over without the German hearing me, and I succeeded. The one that answered me was Mrs. Van Pelz. In the old diary, Anne changed all the names, Mrs. Van Dan. And she knew, how, uh, we knew each other, we were not friendly, but we knew each other. I said my name, she said her name, and she, it really, half a minute we spoke. She said, oh, you want Anne? I said, yes, sure. And she only added, Margot, I cannot call for you. She is too sick, and she cannot even walk to this fence. And it was real, very near. And then I stood there and was waiting. It was cold and raining, and after some minutes, somebody is calling me very carefully, and it was Anne. First thing, we started to cry, both of us, and I said, how do you come here? I was sure you I'm in Switzerland. And then, very short, she told me, we never went to Switzerland. We were in hiding in daddy's office in Amsterdam, and we were betrayed. And really, they were sent, she told me, we were sent to Westerbork, and then, after a month, to Auschwitz. That was the first time that I heard the name of Auschwitz, because we only heard always to the east. Auschwitz, a little village in Poland, nobody knew about it before. And then she also told me about the gas chambers, and I told her that my mother died by childbirth with the baby, that my sister was in the meantime healthy. The doctors after the war explained to me in Holland, in Westerbork, it was very humid and it couldn't dry. Her pus in her ears wouldn't dry. In bergen Belsen, it's very cold and that was for her the good thing without medicine. It dried and she was healthy. But my father was really dying and I told her and Anna said to me, but I have nobody anymore. And that is, I was so sad about later when I learned her father was alive. She thought her father is dead. Why did she think so? Because Anna in Auschwitz knew that everybody under 15 and over 55 goes immediately to the gas chambers. So her father was 56, so she was sure he is dead. But, you know, there stood always Mengele or one else of this uh, SS man, and they wouldn't ask everybody. There stood always a thousand people, and they were very much in a hurry. So they just looked, and he would sign with his finger. There could be somebody 30 years old, but he looked sick. He went to the left, to the death. Mr. Frank looked healthy, looked younger, and he went to the right. And Auschwitz was liberated in January, we much later. So he was lucky, he was already very sick, but he was still alive in January. And Anne didn't know. I thought if she would have known, maybe she had more strength to survive. Her mother had to stay in Auschwitz, and she was with her sister in Bergen-Belsen. And then she asked if I could help her with some food. 
So we also didn't have much more food than they had. But the first package we got, and we know the Red Cross, you know, is there to help people. They helped in Yugoslavia, they helped Arab people. We didn't get any packages from them till February 45. And at that time, only the people with the passports, all the others not. So we got everyone two very small, like a book, package. And exactly then I met Anne. So I said, Anne, I try what I can do. Come again in two or three days. Anne came back in two or three days, and I came with something like a little football. It was nothing but a fortune. Everybody gave me something. We put in a glove, we put in the socks, we put in this bread, you know, the Swedish bread that is dry, that was in the package. Some dried prunes, I don't remember exactly. And when I hear Anne, I say, Anne, be careful, I throw it over the fence. <laughs> and then I hear she's crying and shouting. What happened? I couldn't see her. And there were hundreds of hungry women. And I, I missed her, another one caught the package, ran away with it, didn't give her anything. So I had to calm her down and I promised we try again. We tried again, this time, the third meeting, and the last one, she caught the package, but we couldn't meet anymore because then my father died. And when I, after a week, I didn't go out, when I again looked, where is Anne? Everything was empty. The Germans, even at the end of the war, moved Jewish here and there. Anne stayed in Bergen-Belsen, but I didn't know where, and I couldn't speak with her anymore because she was not next to me. And now I make a very big jump. I came, I was not uh, liberated in Bergen-Belsen. Three days before the liberation, our group from um, Holland, we were sent in cattle cars this time to the east. We should have been sent to another camp and there they wanted still to kill us, but we didn't arrive. We were 10 days on the way, but there was bombing and the train couldn't go. And what happened was that after 10 days, the Russians liberated us. And then through Germany, we came back 1st of July. We were living two months in the villages in Germany. And I came in a hospital, my sister again with an orphanage. And Mr. Frank was already back. He saw our name at the lists from the Red Cross that were published from time to time. And he came to visit me was very hard, it was eight hours from Amsterdam to Maastricht, today it is two hours, I think, but nothing worked in Holland. And I was so happy, and I say, you know, I met your daughter, I couldn't see her, but we spoke three times. Maybe she is alive somewhere in Germany. But he then told me that not his wife and not his girls are ever coming back. And they really never did something bad to anybody. They had to die only because they were Jewish children. And I think we have to learn out of this country that even if we have another color or another religion, we all should try to live in peace together. I know it's very hard. I come from Israel, but we have to try. Thank you. All right, I, uh, <laughs> now the last question before we turn to the audience is, 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 is another one. It, there are survivors who were so angry with God that they uh, either lost faith in God or rejected his existence altogether. Uh, that's not what you did. Can you no, talk about I that a bit? I know. <laughs> that's the only question I don't like. I know. Uh, <laughs> that's why I you saved know? it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, I don't know what to answer you. I, I'm not like this, okay? And I'm happy I'm not like this. Because if you don't believe in anything, it's very hard. And it me, it helped. But I cannot answer for others. I think it's a wonderful answer. <laughs> there are two questions, uh, interesting enough, about Miepchis. Mm. And for those in the audience, probably very, very few who don't know who Miep was, Miep was a refugee herself from Austria who came to the Netherlands and uh, stayed in the Netherlands, got married, and uh, she uh, 
was the one that, uh, among several, who helped uh, the Frank family while they were in hiding. She's still alive. She lives yeah. in Amsterdam. I visited her a month ago in Holland, and she was wonderful. <laughs> well, uh, the question here is, did you know Miep Gies prior to the war? Um, yes, but not very good. You know, mm -hmm. if I came to the Franks and she was invited, and so mm -hmm. yes, I knew her. Mm -hmm. And you already said she was wonderful, so... Did yeah, she was very sick some years ago. Yeah. She mm -hmm. had a stroke, but she spoke again wonderful, and she remembers everything. Mm -hmm. And was very nice to visit her. I was with my granddaughter, and she was very excited to meet this wonderful woman. Then Look, you have, may I just say something? Course. Me brought food for seven people. And she went with her um, bicycle in the country to buy this food. And if a German would have caught her, he would say, what do you need so much food? You have no children, you have one husband. He would immediately have known that she helps Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So she every time went to bring food, she did it under life um, uh, danger. And I think that was something very, very important and good. There's a question, uh, Mrs. Pick, that, that, that is always asked, and you know the question. Um, who do you think betrayed the Frank family? There are three possibilities, and we will never know who it was. There was this man that worked in the, um, how do you say, in the um, Marsan. Um, he worked there to make the spices. Marsipin. In, in the their store. stores, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they thought it was him, and I asked Mr. Frank, and Mr. Frank said, no, the police was uh, with him, and they said it's not him, because he had his son in his own home in hiding, because he was afraid they would send him to Germany. And people that hide somebody will not go and speak about others. But you can say the other way around. He could say to the Germans, I help you, you help me. Yeah, let my son hear and I tell you what I know. But the police twice looked after this man and they say it was not him. Mm -hmm. Then there is a second uh, version of the book of Mrs. Um, what's her name? Um, the book of, oh, I forgot the name Miller. of the lady. Miller. The Mrs. Miller. Anne Miller. The se second book uh, mm -hmm. about Anne, the biography. Go ahead. And she writes that the SS man that was found after the war, he didn't remember, but he said it was the voice of a woman. And now there's another story. They thought it is the wife of another man that worked there. And her son was with the SS and killed in Germany. And so she was very afraid if there are Jewish people, they will take my husband, they will say he knew about it. And then I have no son and no husband, so why shall I not tell there are Jewish people? But that's also not, um, we don't know. The family members, uh, she is dead already, they said it could explain a lot of questions, but. We don't know. And the third um, is from Carol Ann Lee, the mm -hmm. last book written about Mr. Frank. And she said there was a uh, Nazi, a fascist, and he worked with Mr. Frank, that Mr. Frank did uh, some um, selling to the Germans, and he once said uh, the Germans are bad people or something like this, and he the whole time said, I am going to the SS and will tell about you, and he gave him money. We will never know what it is. This Mr. Ahlers was a very bad person, but we don't know. And the Dutch uh, official um, offices don't know who it was. Brandstetter was the name of this lady. Um, no, with an M. That, uh, with the first mm -hmm. uh, uh, that she wrote about the woman that uh, went to the Nazis. What do you think who it was? <laughs> I think we'll never know, and I think it... Uh, Mr. Frank it didn't want to know. He, he does, said it doesn't uh, exactly, bring anybody exactly, back. Yes. And, and now here, he here, here's an entirely different question. 
Did you get married after the war? And did you have? Oh, sure. There we go. I said because before I have, I'm a grandmother. I got married in 1950. I have three children. I have, thank to God, 11 grandchildren and one great grandchild. Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> well, here's a, here's one granddaughter is here. I don't know where she is sitting. Tali, where are you? Where is she? Stand up. Now, here, here's an, an interesting question. Too, that after all you've been through, why did you choose to live in a violent place like Israel? Because that is the only place that I hope belongs to us. And I hope we can stay there always and sometimes also get peace. I don't want to be thrown out another time from somewhere else that they don't like us. So this was uh, my upbringing. My mm -hmm. parents always brought me up. You go to Palestine, it was then. And now it's our country. And I think it's the only place for Jewish people to live there and to be there and to be happy also once. And here's a question that I think you partially began to address. What motivated you to keep going, especially during the know. dark and lonely Look, night? If you are young, it's not the same. Maybe if I was the age I am now, it, I don't know what would happen, but if you are young and you get married and we had to build the country and you know, uh, it, was, uh, it was easy, mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. And now I think if I tell about what happened, people have to know. And I also think it's important and I do this. And that, that leads to, to two questions that are fairly similar. Uh, what do you think is the most important lesson we can learn from the Holocaust that is relevant for the issues we face today? And That's how do you what feel? I said yes. Because, yes. Uh, before. And how do you feel when you hear that genocide still occurs to this day? I said before, we have to learn something out of the whole story that we have to live together mm -hmm. in peace, but uh, we don't know how in the meantime. So maybe people have to teach more. And then the last question What is it like when you meet other survivors? What is it like when you meet other survivors? Oh, the same as other people, I don't know. I am happy that they survived, but uh, I don't know them. So if I get, uh, maybe it's a little bit nearer, we have things together, but right. uh, mm -hmm. Good. the other grandmother of my granddaughter, she was in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. so we had immediately connection together. Mm -hmm. But then my grandson one day said to me, You know, the other grandmother suffered much more than you. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't comparing, and I'm sure she suffered much more than me. And, and here's a question I've absolutely never seen before. The little Dipper 2 Club you uh, had was something you didn't really mention, and I wanted to know about it. Please uh, talk about it. I don't remember it. so much. We <laughs> just played together, you know, and there uh, I don't remember so many much about it. Okay. We were just good friends and that was the name we took for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, Mrs. Pick, it's, it's been a memorable evening. We, we all, I think, walk a little bit taller in your shadow and you, you give us such hope, which you're witnessing. Um, so many important lessons to learn from you. Um, I think you're such a strong example for all of us on how to live our life, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that you come to us once again, and uh, that you inspire us to uh, be sure that uh, we all help to make for a better world together. I hope so. so. I thank you that you try to do it here. I want to thank you very, very much. <laughs> and <coughs> I want to... Uh